Kathy, and good morning to the other side of the ocean. Uh, and welcome to the afternoon session of the Wednesday of Ecological Systems. Uh, it is really a pleasure and a honor for us to introduce Professor Simon Levin. Professor Levin is an applied mathematician and uh, is working in uh, ecology and developed the foundations of special ecology and did a very deep research on pattern and scale, very fundamental research. More recently, he has been doing research at the interface between ecology and economics, uh, especially problems of public goods, common pool resources and the global commons. And he's also doing amazing research on theoretical development of uh, tipping points and bifurcation theory in ecology. He's a James McDonnell Distinguished University Professor in Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at Princeton University. He was also adjunct professor at Cornell University since 1992 in Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. And uh, well, he has won uh, numerous awards including uh, National Medal of Science, uh, Ramon Margalef Prize in Ecology in 2010 in Environmental Sciences. Uh, she, he has a, a very wide uh, membership. For example, since 2003, he's a member of the American Philosophical Society. Also, since 2000, he's a member of the National Academy of Sciences. And uh, since 1992, fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, he's editor and advisory board of about uh, more than 25 journals. Professor Levin has an extraordinary scientific record. He has been working recently in SARS-CoV-2 epidemiology, also evolution, multi-scale human natural interactions, quorum sensing and evolution of cooperation, biodiversity, mathematical ecology in general, evolution and social sciences, and also ecosystem resilience. He has more than 90,000 citations. Uh, this is uh, really, really impressive. And he has published in, in, in the best uh, scientific journals, uh, such as Science, Nature, ENAS, etc. So we, we really want to thank uh, Professor Levin for joining in this conference. Um, the title of his talk is Systemic Risk and Opportunity, Alternative Realities in Social and Ecological Systems. So, you have the word, uh, Professor Levin, so you can start as you want. Very good. Can you hear me? Can you see my slides? Yeah, everything is okay. Okay, well, thank you very much for your kind introduction. It's always uh, good to be back in Barcelona, although I'd rather be there in person. So thank you very much. Um, and uh, first of all, I want to thank the various uh, funding sources, I won't go through these, that have supported my work. Uh, over the years leading up to this. So uh, increasingly, of course, we're hearing news about impending catastrophes um, of a variety of kinds, um, news about the weather and their historical precedents as documented in Jared Diamond's book on collapse. Ecological and socioeconomic systems indeed can undergo sudden transitions. And if you're really interested in this area, I recommend to you Martin Scheffer's book, Critical Transitions in Nature and Society, which covers the spectrum of um, applications. For example, stock markets crash, as we all know, but they also recover. Uh, and those are critical transitions of a sort. And we're all living through this uh, current pandemic uh, in which uh, the COVID-19 um, virus went into outbreak um, and different strains go into outbreak, but recently, at least in the US and uh, some other places, uh, it's coming down. So we get sudden transitions, which may or may not look discontinuous. In general, the potential for phase transitions or critical transitions, and I'm gonna come back to that point later, can make our lives better. It, uh, it helps to uh, cool our drinks, it helps us to make coffee and tea, um, but it can also make our lives worse. Uh, sudden regime shifts are crucial to our lives uh, and to sustainability. We, we focus on collapse usually and shifts that make matters worse, but it's also important to realize that sometimes regime shifts can represent our way out of bad situations, as in stock market recoveries. 
But as I said, we do worry about the critical transitions that make things worse. Uh, for example, global forest cover is changing uh, at rapid rates. Uh, we're losing biodiversity at unprecedented rates. These may or may not uh, be critical transitions, but they are sudden changes. Uh, and the cause, causes of biodiversity loss are many having to do with habitat loss and climate change, uh, over-exploitation, et cetera. And as Tim Lenton and his collaborators have pointed out, there are likely tipping points uh, even in the climate system uh, and in the um, and in the movements of, um, of, of water patterns in the ocean. In addition, it may be really just small events um, like the um, um, events in Tunisia that led to the Arab Spring that can trigger transitions. A few years ago, a number of us collaborated on a paper uh, introducing what we called femto risks in international relations in which very small events uh, could lead to major international changes. Uh, and, and these transitions do not occur uh, in isolation from one another. And another recent work with my former postdoc, Juan Rocha, uh, we documented the relationship between different kinds of regime shifts, some of them physical or biological and others of them social or political, uh, cascading regime shifts within and across scales. So this is an important area and it's important. It's an area with a lot of uh, open mathematical questions to be addressed. The key issues from a systems level perspective are, can we anticipate um, critical transitions? Uh, can we design systems so that those so that those critical transitions have less impact upon us? And more generally, how do we govern in the face of extreme events? Ecosystems in the biosphere are complex adaptive systems. That means they are heterogeneous collections of individual agents that interact locally. Uh, and the system evolves, and I don't mean it in a technical genetic uh, sense, and, uh, but they change dynamically based on the outcomes of those interactions. But not only the ecological systems, but the socio-economic economic systems with which they are linked. What are the features of these complex adaptive systems? Systems made up of lots of individual agents who follow their own agendas. Well, the dynamics play out on multiple spatial, temporal, and organizational scales. It's the system self-organized, giving rise to patterns, emergent properties, constant unpredictability, potentially multiple stable states, path dependence, and hysteresis. And as we've seen with the pandemic, contagious spread uh, and systemic risk. More generally, they have the potential for destabilization um, and what we call regime shifts. And that can occur either due to exogenous factors or through the slow time scale evolution of parts of the system we're studying. So there's an obvious need for early warning indicators of collapse. I think any of us would realize that what the situation we're looking at here is not a good situation. There are early warning indicators of collapse. Can we find such early warning indicators in the systems of interest with us? Um, not just of collapse, but also of recovery. Well, as Martin Skeffer and his co co colleagues, and I'm one of the collaborators on some of the work, have pointed out many such transitions have characteristic early warning signals. And you can see them in the by looking at the cartoon on the lower left, the idea that many equilibria can be thought of in terms of a landscape in which a ball is moving uh, and the ball comes to rest uh, at, the, at the bottom. And if it's pushed away from that bottom, it will return at a rate that depends on the on the shapes of the of the basin that it's in. But over time, one might lose um, the characteristics of the basin, at least in some directions, and therefore lose, um, lose stability. So one of the things that is an early warning indicator is something called critical slowing down, a concept that's familiar from the theory of phase transitions in physics, which is the rate at which the system returns to the equilibrium um, becomes less. And that's generally associated with an increasing variance in the system and an increasing autocorrelation, 
uh, thing stays away from the equilibrium longer. Uh, and it may actually start, if there are multiple stable states, it may begin to flicker between states. So these are all early warning indicators, but they don't apply to all sorts of ways in which systems can transition. And two of my former students, Carl Bodeger and Alan Hastings, together with Noam Ross, have written several very deep papers on early warning signals, this one in theoretical biology, and what the problems are in making assumptions that all uh, critical transitions so, show those early warning signals. So I think it's a very promising area, um, and many systems do show those early warning signals, but we have to exercise some care. The analogy with physics and phase transitions is very tempting. Uh, phase transitions um, like icing models or models of magnetization provide a, a model for this, but many of, it's a confusing situation because most of the early warning indicators that I listed there are characteristic of what in physics uh, are, are called second order phase transitions, uh, where it's the derivative of, of a quantity of interest that, um, um, that is, is changing. But uh, it, many of the properties of the transition to, seem to be more like first order. So maybe the analogy between critical transitions and, and first and second order phase transition is not the right analogy. I don't have the answer for this today, but my postdoc, George uh, Hagstrom and I have been trying to resolve this paradox of the relationship between cr the critical transitions in, that we see in ecological systems, for example, and phase transitions in, in the theory in physics. Um, and we think that maybe a, an under, represented kind of uh, an understudied uh, kind of instability in physical systems, which is not exactly the same as first or second order phase transitions, spinodal instabilities um, might be a better analogy for a lot of the transitions. This occurs when one has a metastable state that ceases to be a local equilibrium, a local minimum of the free energy uh, and causing it to lose thermodynamic stability when the system reaches the spinodal point, the energy barrier, and I'll show you a, a diagram, disappears and the system spontaneously transitions to the equilibrium state. So this is really the picture of what's going on uh, in a spinodal um, instability. Um, one has with the blue line there, two basins of attraction. Uh, and um, as the, the middle of that becomes depressed, um, the one gets these early warning signals like critical slowing down, and eventually you lose that um, that hump between them entirely, uh, and only one equilibrium, only one steady state exists. So this is what a lot of the ones that we're going to be talking about look like. Um, there are a lot of features that are similar to second order phase transition, but the critical the critical exponents that one sees near that are different. So. I don't have much more to say on this. We're still trying to work through this analogy. It all reminds me of some of the earliest work I saw on this topic uh, more than 50 years ago when Rene Tom was writing about catastrophe theory in which he would write the, the dynamics of the system um, in terms of the gradient of a potential, that potential being a polynomial of low degree and try to identify um, the various ways that bifurcations, many of them, including saddle node bifurcations, which are like the ones that um, some of the ones that we'll be talking about today. Um, and one would see the sorts of bifurcations that, um, that one was observing in nature. So it was natural to say, I see these observations in nature. It must be what Rennie Watam was talking about. But there's a danger, of course, that in assuming that if A implies B and one sees B, that A must have happened because we know that there are lots of different ways that B could have occurred. So I think it's a very promising area, but I, we have to be careful. One other avenue that we're exploring here has to do with synchrony, obviously related. Um, synchrony can reduce the robustness of the system by reducing dimensionality. Uh, for example, in stock market uh, crashes, 
one often sees what were previously independent measures uh, of the health of the markets beginning to go up and down together, one loses the independence of the elements. When, when that independence is lost, we conjecture that that makes it easier for phase transitions to occur or for critical transitions, I should say, to occur because things are not pulling in different directions. They're all moving in synchrony. And so with George and uh, with another former postdoc, uh, uh, James Watson, we are looking at uh, dimensional reduction uh, in systems as an early warning indicator. It's related to the, to the high degree of uh, autocorrelation that uh, I was talking about before uh, as an early warning indicator of system of transition, but it's a, it's a mechanistic um, introduction to uh, why systems might be losing, might more easily move, for example, through a wormhole into a different um, domains. And we're looking at correlations in financial market and housing market variations, et cetera, to see those changes. So for the rest of the lecture, I'm going to focus primarily on ecological systems with some discussion of social systems at the end. Um, critical transitions have long been of interest in ecological systems. Uh, one of the most famous examples are the, um, the spruce um, budworm um, that uh, um, originally uh, Buzz Holling and Bill Clark talked about, um, but became more famous through the modeling done with, uh, with Don Ludwig and Dixon Jones. Um, all three of these authors uh, have passed away uh, now, sadly. Um, but Ludwig Jones, and uh, the story behind this, by the way, is that Holling gave a lecture on his model, um, which involved large numbers of parameters, a high degree model. And Ludwig, who was in the audience, said, I can capture that in a much simpler model. Uh, it's a paper that I it, it appeared in the Journal of Animal Ecology, and I recommend to everyone, it's a wonderful teaching tool. Um, Ludwig wrote down a rather simple set of equations, which played out on multiple time scales. Um, in the bottom plane there, you see the parameters which evolve on slow time scales, which include things like the quality of the forest. And then in the vertical dimension is the budworm density. Uh, the budworm is that um, insect that causes these um, these waves of death uh, and damage in, in spruce forests, but also in balsam fir forests. <clears throat> and as you can see, in some regions, there are, if, if one projects up, there's a single equilibrium. Think of the budworm density as, uh, as evolving on that dynamic. And, this, and the surface you see there is the equilibrium surface. So in some areas, there is a single equilibrium, but above that sort of semi-triangular region at the bottom, there are um, two potential equilibria. And so um, as the forest quality changes, depending on how it changes, one can move from the bottom sheet to the top sheet, and one could do so smoothly if you moved around that cusp or through a discontinuity as you move straight through it. Um, and depending on how that occurs, you may or may not see early warning indicators. Well, we've been interested, um, and we means largely my former student and current colleague, Carla Staver, um, along with Sally Archibald in South Africa, have been interested, this is not our paper, have been interested in forest savanna boundaries and how they shift and how climate change may lead to this shift. So this has involved building models of the dynamics of these systems. We know that savanna forest boundaries may shift on a global scale. Um, and um, there have been a variety of papers on this topic. Uh, the one at the bottom is by us and the one at the top by Martin Skeffer uh, and his group. Um, both published back to back, by the way, in an issue of science a few years ago. Um, documenting the potential for alternative stable states. And our data arose from an analysis of the MODIS data sets, global uh, remote sensing data sets. 
which document that there are multiple stable states and uh, uh, and uh, I'll show you a little bit more about it. And it and our paper um, conjectured as well that um, that fire is playing an important role. Why? How does fire play a role? Well, the system is either dominated by grass or by trees. The grass burns, but it doesn't really kill the grass. It cuts it back, but it prevents the trees uh, in the savanna from advancing to adult stages and maintains the system as a, um, as a, a grass dominated system. And there are interesting evolutionary questions that go with this because grass therefore has acquired uh, the capacity to burn easily and promote fire because overall uh, it sustains the system, keeping the trees from taking it over. Once the trees take it over, um, they can't be damaged by fire anymore uh, and, they, um, and the system becomes a tree dominated system. So this is the simplest model that we wrote um, to describe the dynamics of the system. We thought of the landscape as being either occupied by grass, by saplings of savanna trees, or by those trees that you so see in the lower left that have grown uh, to escape fire. Um, and we've also built uh, together with former postdoc Emanuel Scherzer, uh, a model of fire spread in these systems. I'm not gonna show you the fire spread model, but it's a percolation process, um, which basically, uh, says that when the grass coverage exceeds a certain amount, there is a transition, a threshold in which fire can spread much more rapidly. Um, can turn that upside down, with, which is to look at the rate that saplings, which is the S in this equation, advances to become adult trees. Um, and you see that in the picture um, at the critical value of grass coverage uh, at which fire can spread easily, that's also the critical value at which um, <clears throat> saplings um, do not um, advance to, to become um, adult trees. Um, and, um, um, and so you get this sort of non-linearity, oops, didn't mean to do that yet in the model. Um, so we, the, the, there is no bare space. The, um, the landscape is assumed to be occupied by grass, saplings, or trees. Um, uh, I'm trying to point out things here, but it keeps advancing on me. Uh, and the nonlinear term, the, these terms here re represent the fact that there's a natural death rate of saplings and of, and of adult trees, and that, uh, and that becomes converted back into grass, but the nonlinear terms are the crucial part of this. And by the way, note at the bottom, we're assuming everything is either grass, saplings, or trees. Um, the grass becomes converted into saplings at a rate that's proportional to the grass because um, that's how much can change, but also proportional to the number of trees or the coverage by trees, which um, um, produces uh, the propagules that end up with saplings. But most crucially is this term here, omega of GS, which is what you see represented uh, in the upper right. I don't know whether you can see my cursor, but you can, you can see um, the term omega of G, and it's the rate at which saplings get converted into trees. So this is a simple system um, that we analyzed, um, and it can be understood as the, um, the equilibria can be understood as the intersections of the two isoclines uh, that come out of the, those equations, a very simple analysis. And here I've drawn the isocline, the isocline so that they intersect in three points. And it's easy to show that those ones that are denoted by circles are stable points and the one in the middle is an unstable point, very similar to what you saw in the spruce budworm diagram. If the conditions are slightly different, then those curves will only overlap in one point, a stable equilibrium, which might occur at low grass cover or it might occur at high grass cover. So 
let me summarize that with this picture, which is basically the same picture one gets out of the um, out of the budworm, um, namely on the bottom axis precipitation, on the vertical axis axis ecosystem state, which is grass cover, and you see at low precipitation uh, we have lots of fire, and the only stable state is grass. At high precipitation we have very little fire. Uh, and the system transforms into a tree dominated system. And in the middle, there are, um, there are two possible equilibria. And as we move close to those two critical points um, that lie below F1 and F2, um, we see the potential for uh, sudden transit. In fact, as you get close to it, we may see flickering, we may see an early jump. But when we hit the point, there's a sudden transition. But there are early warning signals here. So savannas, and, and, and the implication of this diagram is through climate change, we may be moving the system um, one way or another towards a grass dominated or, or a tree dominated system, depending on whether precipitation is increasing or decreasing. So savannas represent a stable alternative to forests with long-term temporal persistence maintained by fire. And um, as Skeffer and, and Carpenter and others have shown, there's very similar behavior in shallow lakes <clears throat> when they are um, overloaded with, with phosphorus, they may translate, transform from a lycotrophic to eutrophic systems. And of course, as with the budworm or perhaps with the COVID-19, uh, other pathogen systems may go through these tipping points. And we're particularly interested in the role of climate change and threatening such shifts. Just as an addendum, although I won't say much about it, um, Carla and I went then went on to a more complicated model uh, in which we looked not only at savanna trees, but forest trees. I'm not gonna take you through this model, there isn't time. It's a much more complicated model. It has lots of different behaviors in it, including periodic solutions, uh, stranger tractors, heteroclinic cycles, Etc. And so, together with Jonathan Tubal, we published a paper a few years ago uh, in PNS uh, analyzing this system. And this will just give you an idea of the complexity of the system as we vary two of the key parameters. We get all different sorts of behaviors um, stable oscillations, unstable, um, supercritical Huff bifurcations, et cetera, and, and heteroclinic orbits. Um, happy to send this paper to anyone here. Getting back to the implications, the importance of these types of dynamics is huge. What you're seeing here is what the MODIS um, data tell us, um, namely that there are some regions of the world in which the temperature and precipitation guarantee for us basically that the system will be <clears throat> dominated by forest. There are other, and those are the dark green areas. There are other areas where it's guaranteed they'll be dominated by savanna. Um, and those are the very light uh, tan areas. But then there are other regions on the boundaries between them, uh, which according to the model would lie in that middle region, by stable. Some of these are currently savanna and some of these are currently forest. But you can see that there's a clear spatial component and obviously, if we under, want to understand the dynamics um, of where these boundaries occur, we've got to go beyond um, the ODEs that I showed you to build spatial models of one sort or another. And we've done a, we've built a number of those sorts of models. Uh, and our current work has is asked, continues to ask questions: Are like, are the cycles that we're seeing in the model real? How do we incorporate space? And there, we've had a number of papers. Um, that have explored this by building in the transport of propagules uh, and the potential for fire to spread to understand where the boundaries occur and how those boundaries might shift in the face of climate change. And most recently, we've been building models of, that take into account the stochasticity of the system, the probabilistic dynamics, which will help us to understand what's going on at those boundaries. Um, and um, in, in that work, largely um, uh, led by my uh, collaborators that I'll 
especially Jim Wang um, and Jonathan Tubal, um, we we basically derive um, a, a a diffusion like uh, equation for the probabilistic dynamics of the system, uh, and that's and that's all built into this paper here, which just appeared this week in the Proceedings of the National Academy, called "Unifying Deterministic and Stochastic Ecological Dynamics via Landscape Flux Approach," in which we show that through the probabilistic model. Um, you you may get these um, areas that are um, that are um, deterministically one or the other, or we may get these areas in which we can only deal with probability distributions. Uh, just as an aside, um, other work, older work done with Miguel Munoz, Munoz um, and and Paula Villa Martin Juan Bonicella, we show that if you introduce noise into a lot of these models. Um, first order transitions become much smoother and, and transformed into second order ones. So in the last part of my lecture, I want to talk about the implications for management of these systems. Um, the importance of critical transitions in these ecological systems, whether it's shallow lakes or, um, or the uh, savanna forest systems I was just talking to you about, or indeed in socioeconomic systems uh, it, that are coupled with these, um, the importance of critical transition raises management challenges. Um, so how do we design for robustness or not? Uh, what leads to robustness in complex adaptive systems? Um, first of all, uh, if, I'm living, if I'm an organism living in a, uh, in a disturbed environment, one day, for example, the rocky intertidal region, one way to deal with it is to be like a coral rigid design, robust components. But another way to address this is to be like a bull kelp and go with the flow. Well, there are analogies, obviously, um, in the way we design institutions. We can build them for today's challenges, um, or we can make them more adaptable and go with the flow. An argument can be made for either, but the point is that they, they may be applicable on different time scales. Rigid design may work best over short time scales or in relatively constant environments. Um, that, for example, the um, Polaroid camera was very popular when I was growing up. You can't find one now unless you go to an antique store. Whereas flexible design may work best over long time scales or in fluctuating environments. Nikon followed this pattern uh, and lots of different models changing and Nikon uh, still a, a strong player in the market. In changing environments, like Lewis Carroll wrote, you have to keep running just to stay in place, like the Red Queen. I hope you're familiar with that work. Um, a biological example is the influenza virus, but maybe we're seeing this as well, I hope not, with COVID-19, um, in which the surface proteins on the influenza change in response to the um, growth of um, immunity within the population. And so influenza A has stayed in place because one strain replaces another. Um, and the individual strains are not robust at all. They're like the bull kelp. It's built in flexibility, adaptability into the system. Another point is that robust regulation depends on feedbacks, but feedbacks on the right scale. And for example, in our physiological systems, our breathing depends upon these feedbacks. A, a pathological condition, which is life-threatening, is called chain stokes breathing, in which you suddenly, and brain damage can lead to this, and you suddenly go uh, into an oscillation between um, very rapid breathing uh, and apnea goes back and forth. And you see that in the pattern at the top, very rapid breathing, and then periods of no breathing uh, at all. Uh, and so this is because the feedback systems have broken down. They're operating on the wrong scale, very similar to what we saw um, in financial systems in which high-speed trading sped up um, the rate of one component of the system, but the regulatory responses uh, were not adequate to deal with this. There are only two ways to, to deal with this challenge. One is um, to, to speed up the regulatory system but that takes time. The simpler way would be to slow down high-speed trading. And so 
how would you do that? One way you might do that would be to put a one cent, one centime um, tax on every share, which for me at least, and I assume for all of you, that wouldn't make much difference. But for someone who's trading millions of shares a day, that would slow down the system. So Andy Lowe, uh, uh, one of the leaders uh, in mathematical finance and I have been um, doing several pieces of work on this, including a special issue of the Proceedings of the National Academy, which should be out any day now with multiple papers on this issue, have been trying to derive lessons from evolutionary biology and biology in general for financial regulation. Um, what, what went wrong in these financial systems? Well, ecological systems um, and ecological theory has suggested for a long time that overly connected systems are candidates for collapse. Uh, in 2006, um, the National Academy, together with the New York Fed, um, sponsored a meeting called Systemic Risk and Banking Systems, trying to understand what led to collapse in banking systems. Um, and George Sugahara and I, who were at that meeting, uh, joined with the late Robert May to write a paper exploring the analogies between uh, ecological systems and financial systems. Um, and what you see there, at least in part, is the comparison between a network of connectedness in an ecological system and in a banking system. And we said, if we look at these systems like an ecologist would look at them, and this was in 2008 before the financial collapse, we would be very worried that these systems were overconnected uh, and close to collapse. Who knows, we said, for example, how the present concern over subprime loans will turn out. Well, we know how it turned out. And uh, uh, since that, all three of us, uh, Bob, and obviously until he passed away, spent a lot of time talking to people in finance. Um, achieving robustness requires addressing unpredictable extreme events. And um, therefore, we have been arguing, and Andy and I have been arguing, uh, that a good model is the vertebrate immune system. Vertebrates have evolved a hierarchical uh, immune system to deal with the fact that we're going to be challenged on a regular basis, predictably, with a variety of pathogens, um, bacteria, viruses, and the like. What's not predictable, as we saw with COVID, is exactly when and exactly what the nature of that would be, uh, what the pathogen would be. And so we have a hierarchical system, which begins from things like skin and mucous membranes, uh, which try to block out the pathogens. Uh, and then um, a, 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 a hierarchy of responses on different timescales. Um, we have an innate immune system, which is very generalized, cytokines and like, which tries to recognize the pathogens and initiate a very generalized rapid response um, involving macrophages and things of that sort, while our system takes the time to develop more specialized adaptive responses, um, especially we're familiar with antibodies, but there, some of them might involve T cells or B cells uh, as well. Um, and then ultimately there are memory B cells um, that help to, so that the system, when the system's challenged again, um, it will recognize them and have protection against them. And that's what vaccination does for us uh, as well. So Andy and I went back and explored this analogy for financial systems. This is an article that appeared in the Christian Science Monitor. Um, and uh, again, um, may, may be hard for you to find. So if you want a copy, let me know and I'll send you one. So to finish, the key features of robustness in my analysis involve a system that has some form of redundancy built in. And what degeneracy means down in the lower left is you may have different elements, but performing the same function. Um, diversity and heterogeneity are extremely important um, as they are for, um, for the influenza virus, um, which has um, continually changed and adapted. Building diversity and heterogeneity into any system uh, increases the potential 
uh, for the system to be able to adapt. Um, and not to be forgotten in the lower right is modularity, that is the compartmentalization of the system, which restricts the, you know, the, the ability to see this, the systemic collapse that we saw in the financial system because it was overconnected. And, and ultimately, uh, you'll know this from um, efforts to shut down borders and the like, uh, prevents pathogens from spreading um, beyond enclaves where they began. Herbert Simon, the great Nobel laureate in economics, emphasized the importance of modularity years ago by comparing two watchmakers, one who makes watches from beginning to end and the, the other who builds little modules, gets partway through, puts them on the shelf. They both keep getting interrupted, but the guy on the left never finishes because every time he's interrupted, he has to start again. The guy on the right, has saved his work the same way we do when we write manuscripts. And when he's interrupted, he only goes back, needs to go back to the last module. Building modularity in the system provides protection against systemic spread, but it also creates building blocks um, and um, for future change. And evolution has discovered that. Uh, and so many, both at a phenotypic and at a genotypic level, um, natural systems, develop their own levels of modularity. Modular approaches can also provide pathways to management. As the late Eleanor Ostrom, another Nobel laureate in economics pointed out, she introduced what she called a polycentric approach for coping with climate change, um, in which the idea was that instead of relying on 200 nations to come together all at once, one could build small agreements uh, at a local level, and I don't mean geographically local, but maybe the US and China, the US and the European Union, et cetera, uh, agreements, and those create building blocks uh, at the higher level. Uh, and my former student, Andrew Tillman, uh, and Avinash Dixit, a great um, economist colleague of mine, uh, have been exploring this by building models uh, that look like this, in which the population is broken up uh, in, as Lynn Ostrom suggested into submodules, within each of which there is local cooperation, um, which is easier to achieve in small groups. Uh, but ultimately, uh, we explore how those local pro social preferences, pro social means caring about others, that sustains public goods and common pool resources, and how that may, uh, in the long run, uh, produce benefits uh, at the more global scale. Um, and most recently, and this paper is right now only available, um, you can find it on the web on the SSRN, which probably not familiar to you, it's a social sciences research network. Uh, and, and I, with a number of colleagues, have written a paper called Governance in the Face of Extreme Events. How do we learn from evolutionary processes? And how do we go beyond that? And why do we need to go beyond that? Well, the model we explore here looks a lot like the uh, immune system model um, in which uh, natural systems try to respond uh, at highly reversible levels uh, initially to disturbances. And when that fails, they invoke uh, more and less and less reversible um, responses, but they are largely reactive. And to deal with things like climate change um, and uh, other, global environmental changes, we need to get down to the bottom here uh, and to develop anticipatory mechanisms for promoting change in systems before we reach the tipping points. So to conclude, critical transitions have been an area that's been of interest in ecology for a long time. Um, a lot of the current work obviously builds on old approaches, whether it's the budworm work or Rene Tom's work, uh, but it develops some genuine, genuinely new uh, approaches to these problems while also revisiting old mistakes and making genuinely new ones. I think this remains an exciting area for, for research, one where we need the expertise, especially of people coming out of statistical physics um, and with great challenges for management. Um, what makes these systems robust and resilient? Are there early warning indicators of collapse? Can we design systems to increase robustness? And how do we govern in the face of extreme events? These are the challenges 
that are occupying a lot of my time. Um, issues of this, this sort of, of critical transitions and sustainability uh, cut across disciplines. Uh, and we're seeing increasingly interdisciplinary work here. Um, and with that, I will uh, finish and thank you very much for, for listening. So thank you. Okay, thanks so much, Professor Larry, for this truly multidisciplinary and amazing talk, uh, revisiting ecological, social, economical, and then going back to the immune system. So uh, is there any question in the chat? I don't see any question. So let, let me comment one thing. So this is about the, what you said about synchrony in systems as a kind of warning signals. Um, to what extent one could think about this effect in, uh, in ecosystems, because I'm thinking in metapopulations, because uh, you know there is this famous paper in 1993 in which um, they saw that when you have metapopulations and, and you have um, a synchrony between the patches uh, due to chaotic dynamics, then the, the whole system uh, becomes, let's say, much more uh, resistant or, or, or uh, uh, persistent in, in, in time. So do you think that synchrony could be a good early, in, early warning signal in ecosystems, especially thinking in metapopulation? Yeah, well, well, I certainly do. I, I'm not sure which paper you're talking about, but I will take you back to the work of um, my colleague at, at Princeton, Brian Grenfell and his colleagues uh, on measles. Um, but I think it applies also. Um, I, 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 I'll give you another example from from salmon uh, populations. What Grenfell's work shows is that measles persist. Um, and, and there are lots of other examples he gives uh, of infectious diseases because of it. And, and I think we're seeing this with COVID too, um, because if it pops up um, um, in, in, in one place and you damp it down, but don't pay attention and it pops up somewhere else, it persists in the system by constantly yeah. recolonizing new areas. We have lots of examples in ecology of what are called fugitive species or early successional species, um, which disappear, um, it, which establish beachheads in one place, build up for a while, disappear either due to management or due to um, superior competitors coming in, but survive in the system by constantly recolonizing new areas. If you suppress mm -hmm. them everywhere at the same time, which would introduce synchrony into the system, those populations would collapse. And so there are lots of ecological examples, I think lessons both from epidemiology and from conservation biology, where it's the absence of synchrony that allows these fugitive populations, including pathogens, to survive in the system. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It is, it is uh, more or less what this article in Nature showed. So, uh, Okay, no, I cannot see any more questions. So I, I would like yeah, to- Yeah, yeah, no, uh, uh, okay, we sorry, have, we, sorry. We do have, yeah. Okay, go ahead. Or, or maybe myself or there was someone else. Okay. Yeah. I cannot see the, the hand. So should should I go? Ahead, go ahead, and then we'll move on. To okay, so I okay. have I, I have a couple of, of, of questions. So related to the financial regulation. So you, you were thinking more on the Slowing, slowing down the high-speed uh, trading. I found a very yeah. interesting solution. Uh, any idea about, about modularity? So it's, could modularity somehow be introduced in those systems? Or because you, you could either design them using the idea of modularity, not that to be a very you know, huge, massive network of people, or, or with, with this slowing down process. I mean... Well, yeah, what, I mean, modularity is a very powerful... I'm talking, when when discussion you know early on in the on in the financial crisis you heard about too big to fail and things of that sort but then um uh, people like alan blinder pointed out what we're really talking about is too too interconnected to fail mm -hmm. um, the canadian banking system did better than the u.s banking system because it was not as interconnected a lot of regulations in banking systems um are are, are in, introduced uh, in, in order to reduce the, uh, uh, the interconnectedness of the system, for example, preventing the big banks from engaging in, uh, in, in certain kinds of uh, uh, financial actions. You know, um, 
unfortunately, what happens is that after a crisis, one introduces legislation, and when that works and you don't have crises for a while, there's a lot of pressure to reduce those. Uh, and, to, and, and I think the systems are, are still dangerously um, interconnected. So I hmm. think building, inter, building modularity into the banking systems uh, it is a very powerful tool, but it's a tool that it meets a lot of uh, political pressure. Uh, we, we also, in, in this special issue, and this paper is available online now. Um, in fact, several of the papers in the um, in that issue are available online already, including the introduction that Andy Lowe and I wrote. Um, but Roberto Romano and I explored another notion taken from biology, um, which is that uh, um, financial regu uh, regulations should undergo um, what's called sunsetting, which is they are only meant to hold for uh, let's say five years, 10 years, whatever, depending mm -hmm. on the regulation, at which time they either disappear or they have to be reenacted. And that has a lot of analogies in biology. It has analogies in apoptosis, program cell death, but even in the fact that we die and are replaced by our offspring, it's a way to revitalize the system. So we are proposing that sunset is another way to deal with it. But mm -hmm. unquestionably, going back to your point, modularity uh, is, a, is an important feature that uh, um, that needs to be built into these systems. And, and I also wanted to ask you, because I've been very interested in, in this idea of this spinodal instability, uh, but I haven't grasped very well what is the exact difference with, with this phase. I mean, if you could, you could just explain a bit farther the idea. So it's, is it that you can really recover? So it's a system where you can really flick easily uh, yeah, so, so, so that's the idea, and that, uh, and and um, first of all, the in general first order phase transitions, the, the 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 transitions we see have some features in common with first order system, but first order systems don't show early warning indicators in general. Um, where, whereas, and the second order systems do, but the critical exponents are, are different. I can't say much more because George and I have just started exploring this. We don't entirely understand the differences, but spinodal instabilities are things that are talked about in, in physical systems, but not usually um, uh, given the same amount of time. Things could be going on multiple places in the system at the same time um, mm -hmm. that could be leading to these transitions. So we'll be happy to talk to you more, Betty, about these things um, as, as, as we learn more. And, and I can I can send you the paper that uh, sure. um, yeah that I listed. I, which I found the the ideas very interesting. You know that I always uh, found physics, uh, phys you know, physics physics ideas sometimes are too simple, yeah. and all all what is you know cross crossing with more intuitive, uh, you know, ecological biological uh, ideas uh, is of my interest. Sure, and and thank you very much for this super nice talk. It's a long time since I was not hearing you talking about so many stuff and, and I've enjoyed it a lot. Uh, so now I, I give the room to other questions. Yeah, so there is a question in the, uh, maybe somebody can read it out in, in the chat. Yeah, Javier, I don't know if it's better if you if you ask directly with a microphone because it's a long, it's a long question. So turn on your micro. Um, yeah, there are two questions in there actually, one of them from Delonzo and one from Javier Garcia Perez. So. Um, well, I think um, um, Alonzo is in there first. Why, why don't um, we hear that question? Okay. David, your microphone is off. Uh, sorry, my phone. Yeah, oh, okay. Thank you for your uh, talk. I found it like so interesting. Uh, also, you published uh, so much that sometimes I, I, I cannot follow all the papers that, that, that are out there. So uh, and, and, and one, well, can one I. I missed is this, this interesting model uh, you presented, the, 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 the Tillman-Dixit-Levin model, uh, yeah. talking about public goods and so on. And um, can you say something about whether cooperation uh, tends to survive or evolve better in conditions of um, scarcity of resources, or it is the other way around? 
that, that's a really interesting question. First of all, let me say a bit about, because I didn't tell you in detail what, uh, what our, our model looked like. And, and, and I, did, I should say a word about some other work we thought. In, in, in the paper with, um, um, with, with Pillman and, uh, and Dixit, uh, the population's broken up into, uh, into subsets. Every individual has a, um, has a utility function, essentially a payoff function. Uh, which depends, it, it, each, each individual can invest either in, it, in, in their private goods or into the public good. Whatever goes into the public good comes back to them, but in some distributed way. Uh, and in addition, they have a, a, a pro-social term in which um, whatever others in their local group get, they get some benefit from. So the first models, which Avinash explored, uh, show how important pro-sociality is to, um, um, to uh, achieving cooperation. Um, but then the idea is when you put this into a, an interconnected system, there's some leakage of the public good. Suppose it's, um, uh, suppose it's clean air or something and I, I preserve my environment and, and I'm living in Portugal and you're in Spain and you're gonna, you'll, you'll derive some benefit from my work. So there's a spillover of the public good uh, and that's what we explore. Uh, in the system. In, in other work with Alessandro Tavoni and Maya Schluter, um, I, we've, I've been looking at um, fisheries and other systems in which one withdraws from a common pool uh, resource, and you can either withdraw, it's a very similar system, you can either withdraw uh, at, um, at a selfish level or at a level which is the social optimum. Uh, the trouble is this, um, the social optimum is not a Nash equilibrium in general. Um, and, um, and, and the question is, um, how do you sustain it? Um, and, um, and that leads you to looking for what are called uh, second best solutions in which you agree to cooperate on something which is not the social optimum, but it's better than what you would get uh, operating on your own. When you introduce fluctuations and scarcity into the system, it depends a lot on how you, uh, on how you introduce it in. So, so your question's a very deep one. Um, I, um, but just to give you an example, um, deer populations are what are called in the ecological literature uh, lingo, um, scramble competitors. Um, and so um, in those circumstances, everybody shares uh, whatever's out there. Um, and so if you reduce the level, you, if resources are scarce and you're scaring, everybody's gonna die. Um, but uh, other, um, other predators, uh, 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 sorry, other um, vertebrates, as the deer are not predators, um, which engage in contest competition, um, you would get a very different uh, outcome. It would be a fewer number of individuals who survive. So depending on which sort of system you're dealing with, you might expect more or less competition a cooperation uh, under scarce resources. In other words, it's not, a, it's not a simple answer to your question. It depends very much on the nature uh, of, of the competitive system. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, yes, uh, of course, uh, yes. It, it's a very deep question and, it, uh, and, and, and one very much worth exploring. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, I'm very interested in, uh, for, for some, for some uh, from some uh, couple of years, I've been uh, seeing how to deal with this uh, question, and um, and of course, I see that it should depend on 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 the details, on of the yeah. system. Well, please please uh, drop me a note. I'd be happy to uh, <laughs> correspond. Uh, and 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 do we have time, Joseph, for the one last question from Javier Garcia? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, this is also sort of a curiosity question on my side. I, I do work for one of the agencies of the United Nations, and I'm very interested. And actually, my, my question is pretty much related to the big question before. So you might have partially answered before. Uh, but basically, um, uh, summarizing uh, the, the current structure of the United Nations and the international governance system, uh, in my views, it, it is still derived from the, from the 1940s, basically. Uh, uh -huh. and. Uh, my question was basically this uh, Ostrom-wise uh, polycentric vision 
uh, of, uh, of governance wouldn't be, in a way, wouldn't be a, a conf basically wouldn't give, wouldn't give rise to, to conflict or to more conflict or to more scale conflict. Or what is your what is your vision about the about the current structure of the of global governance in that sense? Yeah. Okay. Well, that, that's a that, that's a deep question. Often when I when I give a, a lecture on this topic, um, I, I emphasize at the end that um, cooperation in biology has evolved to a great extent, especially in human societies, to facilitate competition uh, with other groups. You build local collectives. Uh, and, um, and, and that provides you advantages uh, in competition with other groups. Uh, and I've argued that the only way we're gonna survive uh, is if we recognize uh, that the enemy we're dealing with is not other groups, but is a common enemy, which is the, um, uh, the, the clay, decay of the, of, of the environment we live in. Um, so I don't think it's um, uh, in conflict to say that if the only way we're going to get through this is if we extend cooperation to the global level, that of course is no guarantee that the polycentric approach is going to get us there. But it, um, but it's the only hope we have. I, I do. So thank you very much for that question, and thank you, thank you, Joseph. I guess I've run out of time now. Thank you. So there are no more questions. Uh, so. Thanks so much, Professor Levin. It was really a pleasure to have you here in this conference. So thank you so much. Right, I'm always glad to be back in, in, in Barcelona. Thanks, Simon. Ne next time for real in Barcelona. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> face to face better. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye. Okay, so now it's time to move to the second speaker, today's afternoon session. The speaker is uh, Frederic Bartomeus. He's an ICREA professor at the Center of Advanced Studies in Blanas. Uh, he's one of the PIs of the Theoretical and Computational Topology Lab. Uh, he studied biology at the University of Barcelona and did a PhD uh, also at the University of Barcelona, also spending some time at the Combat Systems Lab in Universitat Pompeu Fabra. He then actually did a postdoc with Simon Levin uh, in Princeton from 2006 to 2009. Then he did another postdoc here at the uh, Catalan Institute of Climate. In 2010, he got a tenure track uh, with Ramon y Cajal and uh, well, started uh, its, its own lab. And uh, in 2018, he was awarded as distinguished researcher by the National Spanish Research Council, CSIC. And uh, by the City Council of Barcelona, he, he received the Premio Ciudad de Barcelona in 2017. Uh, his areas of expertise are complex systems. He has been uh, specialized in uh, movement animal, levy walks, levy flights, and surging strategies. He has also done some work with anomalous diffusion, also models of dispersion, of seed dispersion, and He's involved in a, in, a, in a very interesting project about the city science and the tracking of mosquito populations. And today he will talk us about search behavior in a model organism, a work on the wild side of diffusion. Uh, this title is very cool. <laughs> okay, uh, thank go, you. Go, go ahead, Fede, thanks so much. Thank you, thank you, Giuseppe, for the introduction. I'm, I'm gonna do my best after Simon's uh, lessons. Um, okay, so so I'm going to start by the end. I'm gonna I'm gonna be presenting the main actors of the work that I'm showing today, which is basically work from from Bruce Juret Cabot. He's my one of my PhD students, and is part of his, uh, his PhD thesis. And this work is done also along with uh, physicists, statistical physicists in the University uh, Autónoma of Barcelona. Uh, Daniel Campos and biophysicists uh, from the University of Toronto. And also I have to acknowledge the contribution of Juan, who's a, a member of our lab as well, uh, data scientist profile, just to show a bit the variety of people that is needed to, to deal with what we are gonna be showing. And also uh, sharing here the funding uh, and acknowledging the funding uh, that allowed this work to be uh, fulfilled and the institutions that are involved. 
So I'm going to start by talking a bit about the model organisms that we are using. Uh, C. elegans, Canorhabditis elegans, is a one millimeter long round worm. Uh, it's from a group of animals uh, named nem nematodes. Uh, it's, it's probably one of the best animals to do um, biomedicine uh, currently, neurosciences, because of all these attributes uh, that you can see here listed. Uh, it has uh, properties that make him really, really a good model uh, organism. And there are very, very interesting things going on uh, at very different levels um, related to, to work with this, with this organism. Uh, there's one thing that is lacking, which is uh, getting more about uh, its behavior and, and, and its relationship with the environment. So that's part of the gap that we want to fill. Um, but of course, uh, I'm working a lot on, on, on movement and movement strategies and search strategies, and we are using this uh, model organism to learn more about uh, how animals uh, do search. And the first thing is just showing you a short video that I hope you can see. Uh, maybe you cannot see very well, but at least some movement could be seen. Uh, so this animal does a lot of stuff. It crawls, it loops, it generates uh, omega turns like the one you're seeing now and other types of uh, strong turns. And also it can pause for long times. Okay, this, is, this is a video of how we process the data, uh, the tracking data that we're having uh, for this animal. But essentially what I wanted to comment here is that despite it's a very simple organism, it has all the complexity we need and we want to explore movement. So everything about movement is already here in this small worm. We're gonna be talking about movement in a specific context, which is the search context. And basically uh, for, for what experimental uh, procedures matters, typically search has been studied uh, in what we call relocation experiments. So essentially you have worms that are eating in a Petri dish uh, they, they eat bacteria and you just move one of these worms, you clean it to be sure that there's no bacteria around uh, its body. And then you put it in a bare uh, arena. In this case, it's an arena that is uh, larger than a Petri dish, much larger, so that we can really uh, see the unfolding of, of, of the movement of this animal uh, in a minimally environmentally um, uh, arena. So, so the idea is that we cannot really control at least for these uh, animals, uh, which are wild types, uh, sensory uh, abilities. So we don't know exactly what is the animal uh, sensing. Of course, it's sensing. It, it, it has chemosensors and, and, and all types of uh, different uh, abilities to, to cope with the environment. But the idea is that in this environment, we are not really promoting any uh, gradient, any sort of taxis behavior. Uh, so that's the best we can do uh, to see what is the reaction of the animal uh, under the assumption that uh, he's trying or it's trying to explore this arena. Okay, so that's an assumption that we're doing. It's putting some human attribute into the animal, like, hey, mm, we are guessing that the animal is really exploring. So if we do that uh, and and this is data from, uh, from Will Ryu and, and, and Mia, who was contributing uh, with her master's thesis in, in the experimental side, uh, and that, that we have been working with this data collection of 48 individuals. It's really high resolution, 32 Hertz, and long-term data for what uh, respects uh, C. elegans uh, typical data. It's 90 minute tracks, and this is uh, what we've been working on. And here I wanted to show these uh, uh, small orange dots, which are very, very stereotype turns that I was showing you before. These are well-known uh, turns that the animal is performing and they are named omega turns, there's reversals, there's something called pirouettes. So these are very well studied. Um, and you have mutants and you can manipulate organisms in very different ways to avoid some of this turning behavior or maybe to avoid uh, even chemosensory reactions. So that's uh, the whole panoply of possibilities that these uh, organisms provide. 
But here I'm just showing data for wild types because what we wanted to know is, okay, a normal animal, what would be the normal uh, exploration uh, behavior that it would be having. So when we put this animal in the arena, we, the animal starts reacting with a lot of strong turns here. So this is, this is the reorientation re rates, the, the, the rate related to these strong turns. And you can see that uh, it takes a while for the animal to stabilize this turning behavior. Uh, a while means about 30 minutes. So it's, uh, you know, the behavioral process is not a fast process in which we can uh, really say that we have a stationary uh, situation where the animal has launched his sort of expir expir normal exploratory behavior. These uh, strong turns at the very beginning, we associate them to the fact that the animal was in a very um, crowded uh, environment with a lot of food, with a lot of bacteria, and all of a sudden he found itself in a bare environment. So he's trying to see nearby around uh, whether there are bacteria or not, because the change has been so sudden that he's trying to figure out what's going on until he uh, starts to unfold uh, this search behavior. Okay, so what we're doing now at, at, at SEAP, at our research center, is generating these tracks, but uh, in a much more uh, large arena of 50 per 50 centimeters, which allows us to have uh, 10 hour tracks or so. So is, this is the same kind of tracks that we are gonna be exploring today, but uh, these are new, new, new tracks that we are, um, generating at, at our lab. And as you can see, uh, this, these are very complex uh, structures, right? So the more you, data you generate, the more you can see that the animal is really uh, uh, generating a complex behavior with strong, strong transitions and, and some correlations and coherent movements uh, in one phase or in another phase of the exploration. So just to make a brief state of the art, very simple uh, on, on search theory, uh, mentioning that uh, usually search theory has been dealt uh, as a first passage time problem. So this is a very physicist view, a very physicist-like view, so that the whole problem of, of searching is reduced to the idea of reaching uh, a given border or a given target uh, at a given distance. And if we think in those terms, the best strategy possible is the straight line, okay? The, the, the easiest, more efficient way to go from one point to a point where uh, we are supposed to be having a target is the straight line. Anything related to turning behavior doesn't make uh, a lot of sense uh, under the view of this, uh, of this, of this theory. Uh, here we have a typical equation for the main first passage time in one dimension, which depends exact, exactly on the relative distance between the initial position and the position where is the target. The larger the distance, the more time it will take uh, to reach the target. And in the denominator, you have uh, the diffusion constant, which is uh, a measure of, 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 of the spreading of, of the particle or the animals uh, uh, through time. So the larger is this, um, uh, acceleration or, or, or spreading uh, in this uh, millimeter square or millimeter square per time, the units, uh, so the faster you can reach your target, okay? So uh, part of my research has been uh, a lot about trying to think better on these issues. And according to, to what would make more sense in biology uh, as an idea of, of search, is the idea of, 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 of sampling. You know, when we are searching, it's like we are always in the regime where we are deprived from information. And that's intrinsic to the idea of search. Of course, you can manipulate some information, but you don't have full information about what you're looking for. And uh, under that idea, it's, uh, there's a key aspect of uh, how you sample the space uh, to, to, to reach your targets. Uh, which has to do with uh, this idea of exploration and exploitation trade-off, if you want, which tra translated into a special version is uh, this idea of intensive and extensive uh, exploration. So when you don't know where are targets, where are, how are they distributed, a good idea is to try to look for targets intensively nearby, thoroughly, 
and also try to disperse far away to see whether there are targets in other places. But there should be a compromise between the two strategies. Uh, a typical uh, set of, or class of random works that uh, can solve this trade-off uh, very nicely are levy works. And therefore, there's been a lot of uh, literature related to these works because uh, they show uh, fractal properties. They show clusters within clusters of uh, uh, exploratory areas and then very long uh, you know, dispersal jams across the space. And because of this multi uh, scalability of the search process, it really can help solving this, uh, this trade off. Uh, so, in my view, uh, these ideas are much more close to what uh, we are observing in nature. Then, another thing is that animals uh, are performing levy walks or not. This is another discussion. But in terms of how maths or you know, theoretical uh, questions can inspire uh, some of the biological ideas and the other way around, I think uh, all these theories are much closer to, to, to what we're observing. And I hope that by the end of the talk, uh, you're gonna be uh, also agreeing on, on, on these things. So what's the starting point? We, we have these uh, tracks and and of course, it's not only a particle that you know does stuff, it's a real organism. And, 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 and there's a question like, what is the animal doing that are very difficult to answer? Uh, because we cannot put ourselves, not for the moment, but probably we, we will in the future with C. elegance to get to know what is exactly uh, the animal thinking. Uh, we can also not know why is the animal doing that, but, but we can start by getting interest on in how the animal is unfolding all this complexity. And we know with C. elegans, as I was explaining to you, that you, we have very clear different sets of, of components of movement that are involved in, this, in the generation of, this, of these tracks. So we would start as anybody would start by, che by checking speed and turns uh, of these trajectories. And uh, both speed and turn distributions uh, show the effect of these strong orientations. So these strong rotations that the animal is performing have a translation into very slow velocities and uh, very high turns. That's why we call them pre-orientations. Uh, and, and, and clearly this distribution is biased uh, towards uh, slow velocities because of these uh, reorientations. So one thing that we, uh, well, this is the time series, for example, this is the time series of the velocity of one individual this distribution that I was showing uh, previously is not a population distribution, it's the distribution of one track, okay? And this is the time series of, of one track. And you can see these drops of, of velocity, very strong drops that have to do with reorientations. So we didn't have in this data uh, drops of velocity due to pausing because these animals can pause also for long times, but uh, here pauses are much related to reorientations. And also, uh, as you can see here, the turning angle series, you see, you know, strong turns at the beginning, uh, small, uh, uh, slow, slow movements, or short, uh, small velocities at the beginning related to, to these strong orientations that I was commenting. And then there's some stabilization and, and you have these spikes of turns and, and slow velocities. So one thing that we did, uh, Rouget did indeed, is, is to generate an algorithm to be able to annotate and make a, di a distinction between uh, what are smooth uh, velocities and turns, like what we call crawling and looping, and, 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 and sort out and factorize that from these strong orientations. And here you have an ethogram, a series of, of, of uh, binary definitions and, and, and labels of, of what are reorientations and what, what is crawling. Here is the translation of this ethogram into a track. And here, and that's the nice thing, is that you can see the distribution and through this um, algorithmic uh, you know, behavioral annotation process, we can really distinguish that the distribution of uh, velocity and the distribution of turns come from two very different uh, behaviors. Uh, this is just a, a you know, close up of one of, these, one of the parts of these tracks. And here's the time series of the, the velocity, the time series of the turns. And you can see that there's these drops of velocity that last some time. So 
these reorientations are not really, you know, one uh, second behavior. It's it's behaviors that can last, you know, for the last even time uh, time span, and and they were very difficult to capture. So uh, you know, ha ha having uh, this well defined uh, based on the centroid and the data of the of the centroid of the of the positioning of the animal, it's been a hard task. But we are now quite confident of what we have. And, and we can then think on, on the speed and turning angle distributions as, as, as mix, a mixture of distributions. So you can generate speeds and you can generate turns from two different behaviors. And we have identified the distributions underlying this, uh, these behaviors. And uh, that's very nice. We could already do simulations with this, sample these distributions and generate tracks and generate lots of stuff. But uh, before doing that, we were also needing to uh, take care of, of the orientations. One, one we, once we have the, the, the classification of reorientations and, and, and looping or crawling or smooth, smooth turning, uh, then we can investigate the time um, that uh, there is between each of these reorientations. So here, remember that I told you that these reorientations are very much modulated by the animal, but when we get this stationary period, we can clearly see that there's uh, uh, a clear uh, power law distribution related to the time existing between these orientations. This is important because this is one of the features that can generate this multiscalarity in the paths and uh, can generate even th these are not strict displacements, but this time distribution, time between strong turns, it has a great impact uh, on the spatial uh, sampling of the animal. And a uh, long time ago, we were already based only on, 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 modeling, on models uh, showing some of these uh, ideas in, in previous papers. So it seems that C elegance performs this sort of power law, uh, power lowish clock, uh, or fractal clock that we call it, uh, as, as time between reorientations. Then we could just go and, and do simulations with this uh, characterization of the movement. But here is uh, where uh, something closer, someone closer to theory, uh, um, and then knows that that uh, you know having a mathematical framework to explore things is even uh, can really help uh, rather than just doing that analysis and, and, and simulations. Uh, so uh, I'm one of these kind of people that that, that really understands that uh, it's an added value to incorporate a, a, a proper uh, formalism to try to study stuff you know, in biology. So we move forward with these ideas and we talk to physicists and, and, and we, we came up with this um, uh, movement description, uh, which is based on, on a Langevin sort of uh, framework. Uh, essentially these are stochastic differential equations. And, 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 and we knew that we would, we would be needing to incorporate all these elements like this, this this looping behavior, which uh, should be introduced as a, as a systematic bias in curvature, we should incorporate these strong orientations and maybe maybe correlations on, on, on velocity. So the basic model is very simple. So the idea is that you have uh, two essential directions of motion, the, the one that is the normal direction of motion and the normal direction, normal meaning the orthogonal direction to the, to the flow of, of the motion. And we have mainly two forces. Uh, one is the propulsive force, this, this gamma parameter, which is generating persistence and attempting to keep a uh, given uh, velocity in that direction. And then we have uh, a Vita parameter, which is the curvature force, which is forcing the animal to move into the other uh, normal component, the orthogonal component of, of, of the motion. And, Stochastic or yes, Langevin frameworks so, uh, are very good to try to connect microscopic processes, to stochastic micro, microscopic processes, and they are typically having a deterministic component uh, for, for each of the variables that one uh, is willing to study. Here we have speed and curvature. We have uh, a deterministic component that you can see here, and then we have a noise uh, that is added to this component, and we have the curvature component with a noise. Okay, from this um, vector uh, velocity, we can get the model and the turning 
and we can see the relationships between the curvature and the turning angles and the speed and all of these um, interesting relationships that come just from the, the analysis of the, you know, the, the, the unfolding of the equations. Another interesting thing is that this noise here that you can see on the, on the velocity equation can be related to this gamma parameter and to the variance of the velocity. Okay, so it follows also from the framework that we can characterize this noise in such a way. So what is coming up now? So it's just coming, what we are doing is basically uh, trying to fit uh, from the data each of these parameters. And we can do that very nicely because now we have factorized, you know, the reorientation component from the um, crawling behavior. And this Langevin framework is just representing the crawling behavior. On the top of that, we're gonna be adding the reorientation behavior, okay? So we can characterize very nicely the, the, the average speed and the standard deviation, of course. And we can do that for, this is, these are the wild types that I'm, we are gonna show uh, today, but we can do that, of course, for also different strains of C. elegans, mutants that we have been working with, but today we're not gonna show data on those. We can estimate uh, this gamma parameter, this propulsive force, and we do that uh, uh, studying the, 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 you know, the survival times uh, because there are some correlations in the velocity, as you can see, it's not wide noise. So one way to estimate this parameter is uh, getting to know the survival times above, um, uh, you know, when, when the velocity is above the average value or below. And we can characterize these times uh, with a wavelength distribution. And it happens that the variance of this wavelength distribution correlates perfectly uh, with uh, this gamma uh, parameter. So we can estimate pretty fairly uh, this parameter. We can estimate the curvature force as well through this equation here, just looking at the turning angle distribution. And of course we can do these estimates also for wild types and strains. So all in all, we can measure everything except the noise, which is something that we can uh, not, and the noise of the turns, sorry, it's something that we cannot estimate directly because we don't know that noise, but we can infer or uh, you know, generate this surrogate estimation uh, based on the on the standard deviation. So this noise, we know it's correlated or it's proportional to, sorry, to the to the standard deviation of the turn uh, distribution. In any case, we have a nice table with uh, six parameters that are describing the movement of this animal. And on the top of that, we can include also in our simulations the time events derived from this scaling exponent of the times between turns. Uh, and we can introduce this turning behavior. And we are doing that as a toy model, very simple. We are not incorporating velocities and turnings there. It's just from time to time, the animal is gonna break up um, these, um, this movement described here, and it's gonna be generating a random direction. Uh, and then we're gonna be keeping on with this smooth um, movement derived from the Langevin equations. And uh, we did all sorts of validations uh, that everything is looking okay. You can see that um, this is the empirical data and this is our simulated data with the, with the model. Note that this is a stochastic model. So you generate a lot of variability already. Uh, even you have some, uh, you know, average parameters. And we are not able to recover as much as we would have liked the correlations on, this, on the velocities. But uh, we have been working a lot on that and it's, Anything that is trying to improve these things involves a lot of complexity, a lot of uh, introducing many other stuff in the model. And here we found this equilibrium between, you know, keep it simple. Uh, it's a fair enough, uh, solid enough model for us to explore what we want to explore. So let's not uh, improve it more, though we could, we could uh, by complicating a lot the model. So these are the the example, you know, qualitative example of the trajectories uh, that are the real ones on your, on your left, synthetic ones on your right. And now basically we're gonna talk about the results. So these um, Langevin frameworks, these stochastic differential equations are very, very useful precisely to, um, you know, to, they are describing movement at a very, very microscopic uh, scale. And, and for the search efficiency and the mean square displacements, we really wanted to, 
to look for macroscopic patterns, okay? So essentially one macroscopic pattern that we were looking at is, is the spreading, the diffusion. And just for you to know, the diffusion is the, you know, the process by which a collection of particles are spreading from a given initial point. And you can describe this process very well by, by taking the mean square displacement, which is the, the quadratic displacement, the Euclidean distance between the initial uh, propagation point and the position of the particles at different times. And, and just for you to know that there's this scaling relationship between the mean square displacement and time through a scaling exponent alpha, and this would be the, the diffusion coefficient. And basically the, the interesting thing here is that depending on this uh, coefficient here, uh, the spreading process enters into a sublinear regime, uh, either a linear regime, then we call it, that's what is understood as normal diffusion, or either if, if the exponent, sorry, these exponents are, are wrong here, this should be larger than, and this should be smaller than one. So uh, if it's larger than one, you get into the super uh, diffusive regime, which means that the spreading uh, is it's supralinear, no? it accelerates uh, through time. So what we are seeing here is just uh, the space uh, phase of the parameters, the more uh, critical parameters on how C elegance is controlling its movement, which is this reorientation rate, this, this exponent here, you can take this axis as a, a reorientation rate from large orientation, uh, sorry, it's a small orientation rate to large orientation rates. And here you have this curvature, you know, the looping behavior of the animal. Uh, and, and this is how the mean square displacement, uh, I sorry, the, the scaling uh, exponent alpha looks like. Very interesting thing is this white line here, which is the one iso line. So anything that you can see here is super diffusion. And anything that you can see below this other line is sub diffusion. So, uh, you know, putting uh, in the space uh, of parameters, the parameters that we empirically do observe, we can really see that the animal can transit uh, in different regimes. So if we add here, what would be the average values uh, of mu and beta that we have recovered from our models uh, for, for, for different individuals, you can see that these individuals are uh, following right across these regimes, okay? But this is only the average uh, value. If we go to one specific individual, we move now to individual records and we look at these mu's, these reorientation rates and these vitas locally at the individual level, we can see here how the animal explores the space of parameters and crosses this boundary. So meaning that it can go from subdiffusive regimes to super diffusive regimes and go back and forth. This, is, this would be, for example, another track, okay, another, another individual. So it looks like uh, that while, while they're exploring, they are entering into these regimes uh, and, and that the overall average values of, of, of you know, the, the subregion of, of, of the space parameters that they could possibly be uh, taking uh, is really at the tipping point. No? So the idea is that a small change in mu or a small change in beta it can generate a large change in diffusive properties. So this, for example, is the real track. No, this is this, the, the track of the animal in the space parameter. And this is the real track of the animal. And here you can see it's, you would not tell, it's difficult to tell that there's accelerations and decelerations here, but indeed uh, what this plot is showing us is that this is really a deceleration process so the animal gets stuck, then it enters into more super diffusive regimes, like it crosses and gets about here, and then it goes back to the super diffusive regimes at these other scales. So search, as we can see here also in this very long uh, 10 hour track, it would be something resembling like, like uh, you know, regions of deceleration where the animal is intensively exploring an area and regions of acceleration where the animal is really willing to spread out and reach other areas to look for uh, things. Then another property that we looked at, and I'm gonna try to finish very fast, is uh, on search efficiency. Okay, as I was explaining to you, the basic ideas about uh, search efficiency are related to mean first passage times. Uh, so we, we show here a typical case where you have an initial condition and you just want to know uh, you know, whether uh, what's the time that this 
kind of walks would take to reach this border. Okay, that's meant for passage time. And I can do an average for the population. Uh, clearly here, the condition of search is such that all targets, as this is the border, uh, are at, at a given distance. Let's say that all targets are far away, okay? What we have been uh, finding is that just by changing the circle by a cardioid geometry and putting the initial condition here, we have this other nice search context where the initial condition of the search is such that you have nearby targets, which would be all these targets that are here, and faraway target. And this is a very good scenario for us to check or try to explore these in intensive extensive exploration trade. So what happens with search efficiency for CL and space parameters? So in the case of mean first passage time approach, all targets are far away. It's clear that curvature doesn't help and it's clear that you should keep small reorientations, okay? So anything that is more ballistic uh, or close to ballistic is better. Think that in this model, we always have noise. We have noise around uh, the turns and noise around the velocity. So these are not really ballistic tracks, okay? But of course, looping, generating positive curvatures or reorienting is not helping. What happens in, in this other scenario, the near and far targets scenario? So we can see that curvature doesn't help, but reorientation does help. We know if we make this cardioid larger, that this is gonna be end up at exponent two because of theory. So we, re we are recovering somehow, you know, levy walk reminiscent theory that is showing that when you have this spatial trade-off and you need to find out targets that could be near and far, then reorient reorienting at a certain rate is is useful, not very much looping, okay? So this is again, the same two scenarios. This is where uh, actual empirical data is found. Here, uh, oh, I didn't mean to show this one, okay. He, here we are showing tracks that are at the optimal value. So these are the tracks that would be optimizing the main first passage time. These are the tracks that would be optimizing this, what we call asymmetric uh, scenario of search, you know, the near far search. But we were still observing that, you know, empirical data is here. So what we came up with, or we thought is that, of course, in biology, we are always having sensorial errors. And of course, looping, because basically what you see here is that Vita is larger than zero, might be helping to revisit areas in case of uh, you know, sensory errors. Imagine that you, you cross this border, but uh, you know, there's some probability of failing in hitting the target. At this point, looping behavior becomes uh, useful. And that's what we can see here in this simulation. All of a sudden we see, you know, just by adding you know, a small error, this is, these are not big errors, you can generate a landscape like this where the optimal search efficiency takes place at the right position where the average values of mu and beta are found in our population. We are now exploring a bit more and try to understand this looping behavior. And, and we are measuring the amount of overlap and we can measure for all these space parameters. You know, the, the, you know, in this case, we're measuring the Jacquard index. This is the, the, the percentage of intersections found over loop unions. And, and uh, and this would be an empirical track, for example, this is synthetic data that we have. And we're exploring these ideas as well. So maybe it's not about the error, maybe it's simply about the fact that I want to scan in two dimensional in a proper way, okay? So just to finish the conclusions of this work is that we have seen that CLNs is tuning motor control at a diffusion tipping point, okay? Just at the right place where a small change can make a big difference. And we have seen signatures of optimized uh, sampling, which includes spatial balancing between intensive and ex extensive exploration, includes, includes enhanced dimensionality. So looping helps to generate spatial uh, bi-dimensional overlap and in, uh, helps also to generate uh, robustness to sensory errors. So that's the final slide. Sorry for my delay. Okay, thanks so much, Fede, for this talk. We have time for a short question. 
I think we had one. Yeah, Thomas, go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Fede, thank you very much for your amazing uh, talk. I have enjoyed it very much. Just a very fast question. When I listen to you, your, your explanations about the movement of this uh, elegance, it re reminds me strongly the page rank Google algorithm to order page, uh, well, pages. I mean, for a while you are doing some local movement between different, different pages, uh, trying to optimize the solution given by the Perron Frobenius theorem. And from time to time, there is a small probability that they in the original paper, they estimate by around 15% of moving la, la, far from the original uh, network and then it's going to, to look for in a different place. This could be a possible second explanation for this movement of this uh, elegance, trying to, to, to produce a kind of local movement, searching for a, for a minimal or some function that, that I wouldn't know. Maybe it could be the, the main first passage uh, Function and from time to time doing long movements trying to search uh, in a different place. This could be a possible uh, second uh, or parallel explanation for this movement or this elegance. Well, that's the, that's the that's what I think. I think what if I don't understand badly, I think I think that's this special intensive extensive trade off that we're talking about. Yeah. So 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 the 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 underlying assumption is that if if you don't really don't have a guess of where are targets. Mm -hmm. Of course, if you have some guess, you should try, no? But if you don't have any idea, why I should be assuming that they are far away? Or why I should be assuming that they are very close? I don't have any idea. So I should try both things. Okay. Then that's the basics. And, and for example, you could be doing a levy, no? Then this animal does much beyond that. And I think the interesting thing is uh, getting to know whether this is related to biological constraints of the animal. Mm -hmm. For example, the animal has, it's very difficult for, for the animal not to cure. You know, you have to, he cannot have symmetric, uh, you know, uh, crawling movement and it generates curvature by, by default, no? So maybe he's, he's having constraints because maybe he could be much better doing a uh, simpler random walk than, than what he's doing, no? And of course, maybe he cannot avoid noise, no? But even though he's doing all this other stuff, the, the interest for me is, is, is he really fulfilling some basic things that uh, would make sense? And then getting to know more about the mechanism underlying this process and sort out what is coming for free, like the animal is really not willing to control for that. It's, it's coming from noise, it's coming from the stochastic equation per se, and what is really control, motor control that the animal is doing. But yes, yes, I mean, there's a lot of um, ideas relating to, you know, try to generate these bio inspired algorithms that could be useful for many things like drone sampling in, in, in the environment or, or you know, may, maybe an algorithm for looking stuff in internet. So there's a lot of connections uh, between what you were saying and, and what, what C. elegans is doing. So one key point should be to, uh, to try to answer, which is the, 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 the reason because uh, this elegance uh, worm produced these long fascists is because it's, it's, it's not really natural as, as I, I have understood uh, that the more natural movement is just produce some spirals which are uh, curvatures, uh, very close curvatures. And to produce a long straight passage should be something uh, the motivated by something. So yeah. I, I guess that this is the important thing to, 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 to find and at least Exactly. And, and, and getting to know whether these things come up just from the noise, because okay. uh, that's what we're trying now. If you generate synthetic simulations, how much of what we see in the empirical data comes for free? Maybe, maybe it comes for free or, or not, or maybe the animal is really willing to, to, to do something there. Yeah. Okay. So thank you very okay. much. Fede. So thanks thank so you. much. So let's move quickly to the last speaker today, uh, Sonia Kefi. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, if you want, you can share your screen and see that everything is working okay. So Sonia Kefi is a researcher at the CNRS uh, based in the Biodiversity Dynamics Interactions and Conservation Team at the Institut de Science de l'Evolution de Montpellier in France. She earned her PhD in 2008 from Utrecht University in the Netherlands. And then he, she did a postdoc as a Humboldt Fellow at Technische Universität Darmstadt in Germany before jo joining CNRS. 
He has received also a lot of prizes. Uh, in 2011, the prize Van Marum in Environmental Science from the Royal Society of the Arts and Sciences from Netherlands. She also received the bronze medal of the CNRS in 2017 and more recently in 2020, the Erdos Reni Prize of the Network Science Society. So her research aims at understanding the persistence of ecosystems, so how ecosystems persist and change under pressures, for example, climate changing and land use. Uh, she's doing a really amazing uh, uh, research combining mathematical modeling and data analysis to investigate the role of ecological interactions. Uh, she's specialized uh, in facilitation and in semi-arid ecosystems as well. And she has also used the complex network uh, approach to study uh, the indicators of resilience uh, and uh, warning, or early warning signals, sorry. Uh, she will talk today about, oh, the title is different, okay. The stability of ecological networks. Okay, uh, thanks so much, Sonia, you can start. Uh, you should turn the microphone on, I think it's off. Here it is. Oh, yeah. Um, no. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for the introduction and, and thanks for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here today and have this opportunity to present my work. Um, yes, yeah, so today I'd like to talk about, to you about the stability of uh, ecological networks. Uh, this is work that was done with um, people from my team, Virginia Dominguez Garcia and Ismail uh, Lajaiti. Right, in, um, in 1962, there was a, a famous book that was published by Rachel Carson. Um, and in this book, she denounces the effect of uh, the, uh, the negative effect of, of pesticides on, on both um, uh, human, human health and, uh, and ecosystems. And at the time, so when it was published in the early 60s, uh, the term environment was uh, not really present in, um, in, in the public, in the media, and also in politics. And this book is considered as, as one of the main um, factor that contributes to raise awareness about um, the effect of human activities on nature. And this uh, affected both the general public and politicians. Now, um, 60 years later, um, if we look at the number of, of trends that aim at quantifying uh, the effect of human activities um, on, on, on ecosystems, um, it's very clear that not only have these trends not um, stopped, but they haven't even slowed down. So we're in a context where um, human activities exhibit increasing pressures on ecosystems. And in this context, I'm interested in trying to figure out how do ecosystems cope with these changes? How can they cope with these changes? Uh, are some ecosystems much more fragile than others? Are some ecosystems losing resilience through time? How can we identify these ecosystems and how can we contribute to um, helping preserving uh, ecosystems? Well, so addressing that question requires that we're able to measure stability. Um, and this requires that we have a very clear definition of the concept, but also that we have metrics that allow us to quantify stability on uh, data. Well, going back to the origin of the concept, um, uh, we usually say in ecology that the concept of stability was introduced to the field in a paper from 1969 from Richard Leontine. And um, so he introduced stability by using the metaphor of, um, of the stability landscape, so the potential of the system where the wells are the attractors. Um, and so his vision of stability and his definition of stability is very clearly inherited from, from classical physics. And it's um, a, a static, um, and also local uh, vision of stability. But at the, the end of uh, this paper, Richard Leontine mentions that according to him, one of the most important questions um, in ecology is whether some ecosystem could have multiple stable states under a given set of environmental conditions. And in this case, so meaning two or several wells in the potential of the system, and in this case, um, what can happen is a, an important uh, pressure exerted on the system can make it shift from its current state to a different one that could be very different in terms of either species composition or uh, functioning. 
Well, a few years later, there was an, another paper, very, very important paper in ecology that was published in 1973 uh, by Buzz Holling, in which he goes much uh, further with this idea of um, ecosystem exhibiting, possibly exhibiting alternative stable states, uh, provide a number of examples, and suggest that we should introduce a new concept to quantify what happens in this case, which is the concept of resilience. So he suggests that uh, stability quantifies how fast an ecosystem system recovers from a perturbation, um, a pulse perturbation, so a temporary perturbation. Uh, but resilience quantifies um, how much perturbation a given system can um, absorb before it shifts uh, to a different state that can be a different structure or a different function. So after this initial, these pioneering studies from the, the 70s, um, this, there's been decades of work in ecology about uh, stability and resilience. And surprisingly, despite the fact that um, these concepts are very easy to understand intuitively, we've been very much struggling with how to quantify uh, those concepts in, on actual ecological uh, data. Actually, it's been recurrently stressed in the ecological literature that um, if we want to address the question of stability of ecological systems, we need to adopt a, quanti a, qu a quantitative approach um, that is based on both uh, rigorous theory and, uh, and um, empirical data. So what has been done so far in the ecological literature? Uh, with a number of colleagues, a couple of years ago, we performed a, a review of the ecological literature we looked at um, papers that were published um, since the uh, 50s in a number of ecological journals that included the term stability or resilience. And um, in all the papers we retrieved, we read them and we extracted a number of, of information, um, such as the type of study, whether it's empirical, theoretical, or both, the number of species, um, um, that, that were um, involved in the study, so the, kind of the complexity of the system studied, the type of perturbations that have been uh, studied, and more importantly, the metrics that were used to quantify stability or resilience in those papers. What we find was that overall, uh, since the 50s, we identify 40 different stability metrics that had been quantified in the literature. Um, if you look at the number of metrics, the number of different metrics that were published each year since the 50s, what you see is that this number keeps increasing. So it's not only that there's currently a lot of metrics used uh, across the, the, the ecological literature to measure those concepts, but also it seems that um, people keep creating new metrics um, to quantify those, uh, those concepts. Just to give you an intuitive idea of of what these metrics are. Um, people have, for example, quantified variability. So how much uh, a system is variable in time, for example, temporal variance. Um, asymptotic stability, which is typically the dominant eigenvalue of the dynamical system. So this is something that is more measured in, uh, in modeling work. Resilience, um, which is often um, how, much, how much perturbation you can apply on the system before it shifts. Resistance, which is uh, for um, a certain unit of perturbation, how much a system is displaced, and um, whether the system has alternative stable states, and how many, and what are the size of the basins of attraction. So these are just a, a few examples so that you have an idea of, of the type of metrics that, that people measure in ecological systems. Now, if you look at um, how frequently each of these metrics is used, um, across those papers. What you can see is that most metrics are, have been used um, very rarely in the literature, and a few of these metrics have been used uh, quite frequently. Now, um, we may ask whether that's a problem or not. Uh, well, the fact that there's so many different metrics, uh, it raises um, a problem because it means that it's very difficult to compare studies with each other. So it's difficult to compare studies that are performed on different ecosystem types or different experimental systems, for example, because they don't always quantify stability with the same metric. Um, but it's also difficult to compare or confront theory to experimental studies. Uh, typically, the metrics used in, in models are not the same as the one used in the fields, because clearly it's not 
um, the, it's, it's not the same metrics that are easy to measure in the field or in a model. Uh, so the metrics differ, and therefore uh, we're not always able to confront the theory uh, with observations. But also um, this diversity of metric of metrics, sorry, raises the question of how related to each other these metrics are. Uh, what my colleague Yen Dovnohu calls the dimensionality of ecological stability. So the idea is um, here he illustrates it with three different metrics: a variability, robustness, and resistance. If these metrics are very uh, strongly correlated with each other, it means that basically they contain the same information. And so typically, if you want to measure the stability of a given system, you can only pick one of those, typically the, the one that would be the, the easiest to measure. But if, on the contrary, those metrics are not correlated with each other, then it means that they contain different information about the stability of the system. And if you want to have a, a, an overall idea of the stability of the system, you need to measure these three different metrics. Now, if you go back to the um, review of the literature, what we see is that 71% um, of the papers we studied quantify a single metric of stability, and 92% of the papers uh, quantify one or two metrics. This means that going back to um, 70 years of study on, on stability, there is not enough data so that we can assess the relationship uh, between those metrics. Another point that I find important is that if you look at the complexity of the systems that people have studied, um, basically 86% of the papers study system that have less than two species, which is of course um, very species poor systems. So these are either theoretical studies or experimental work. And um, we may wonder to what extent our understanding, our current understanding of stability based on these very simple systems can extrapolate to communities that are more diverse, like natural communities that we see in the field. So the question that I'll ask in the rest of this talk is, um, how are stability metrics correlated with each other in complex ecological systems, meaning in systems that have multiple species? And here is the intuitive idea of, of what I'll present to you. We're going to use a mathematical model uh, to address the, this question. And um, it's a model of trophic communities, meaning a model of an ecological community um, that, um, that describes how species eat each other um, in an ecological community. So the links are feeding links in this case. We'll apply different types of perturbations on those communities. And we'll measure a number of, of metrics, of stability metrics. And then uh, we want to study the correlation between these metrics to see if some of the metrics are strongly correlated with each other or not. More specifically, what we do is the following. Um, we uh, generate a backbone of the community, so a food web. Um, based on what is called the niche model. The niche model is a model that's uh, based on a number of species and a given connectance, so fraction of links realized, uh, can generate a, a, a structure of a network that has that, that is realistic, that is comparable to food webs observed in the field. So we generate more than 10,000 networks of uh, various size of connectance 0.15. And then we're going to map a dynamical model on top of this backbone based on a very classical model, which is a consumer resource model. Um, so this model, I mean, I'm going to go quickly, but this model describes the, how the biomass of each species in the community changes through time, so BI. And it's a, a very um, classical model. So you have one, one dynamical equation for each of the species, each of the node of the community. It's a model where um, the growth term uh, depends on the type of species you're interested in, if it's a plant or not a plant. Uh, if it's a plant, you have a logistic growth. If it's not a plant, you grow depending on what you eat and how abundant is your resource. Um, species can be eaten and they lose um, biomass through metabolism. Now, um, this, the feeding term here is described by a, what we call multi-species hauling type functional response, which is basically a function that saturates with the abundance of your prey. So a predator will eat more when the prey is more abundant, but this will saturate at some point. So 
uh, what is interesting is these model in these models we can use allometric scaling to estimate the parameters so these models have a lot of parameters but there's um, a number of uh, generic rules in ecology that map um, how based on the body mass of a of an average species of um of an average individual of a given species, you can have a realistic estimation for a number of rates. Uh, for example, feeding rate, growth rate, and metabolism. So this means that if you have, um, if you know the average size of an individual of a species, you can get a, a realistic range of parameter values for all the parameter values of this model. So this is a great advantage because there's so many parameters, but uh, in the end, we don't need to explore them all because we can try to infer at least a realistic range of values uh, based on allometric scaling. Now we're going to use that model we have, the, we have the backbone, we map dynamical equation, and then we run dynamical simulations until we reach steady state. And then we, we apply a number of perturbations to that model that are either press. Press are um, perturbations that are maintained through time. So for example, you increase uh, mortality of all the species in the model. Um, they can be pulse perturbation. So that are um, perturbations that are just um, temporary, for example, you just remove a little bit of biomass of a species, and then you see how the system recover, or we apply white noise. And we see how the community responds to those perturbations by measuring 27 stability metrics that are basically metrics that come from our literature analysis and that are the most frequent metrics used um, in the studies we, we reviewed. Now, based on that, um, we can build a network of stability metrics where the nodes here are um, the 27 stability metrics. And the links between those nodes are basically correlations um, between the metrics. So these are pair pairwise correlations based on, based on Spearman's rank coefficient. So the, the thicker those links, the stronger the correlation between two metrics. Now, the question we're interested in is, um, can we identify groups of metrics that are very strongly correlated with each other? And that would mean those metrics are very redundant. They contain the same information about the stability of the system. Um, to do that, what we apply is a, is a community detection algorithm on that network, um, which for that we use um, a maximum, maximum modularity, maximized modularity. And so the idea of modularity is you want to find groups of metrics that are very strongly correlated with each other relatively more than what you would expect. Um, and it gives you the number of, the optimal number of groups in your, in your uh, network. So based on this analysis, what we find is as follows. Um, what we find is that there's three different groups of metrics that are very strongly correlated with each other and weakly correlated with metrics of other groups. And uh, what you see here is three metrics that um, don't have a clear group assigned. Um, I mentioned at the beginning that we run simulations for um, uh, communities that have very different diversity levels. So from small to large uh, communities, so from sp five species to 100 species. And um, we, we perform this analysis, so this uh, community detection algorithm for different sizes of, of community matrix of communities. And um, those three metrics, they're basically not always um, attributed to the same group, depending on the size of the network studied. So they have, um, they don't have a very consistent group that we can assign them to. Uh, on the contrary, these three groups are very stable. So you always find them independent of the size of the community that you're looking at. Now, those three groups can be uh, explain or interpret it as follows. Um, the yellow group here is a group of metrics that quantify the response of the system to pulse perturbation, so to temporary perturbations. And what, it quant what they quantify is the initial response of the system to a pulse. So how fast and how far the system goes away from its current state initially, just at the moment of the pulse of the pulse. Um, this group of metric is a group um, of metrics that quantifies the response of the system to press perturbations. So typically um, an increase of mortality of either all the species of the, uh, in the community or, um, or only some of the species, or um, they quantify the response of the community to species extinctions, for example. And the third group here, the blue group, is, that is the largest group that contain most of the metric, quantifies um, 
the response of the system to all the different types of perturbations we studied, so either pulse, press, or noise. And it's a set of metrics that quantify how far the system is from, um, from a drastic change in the community. So for example, how much, how much do you need to increase mortality of a given species so that it leads to at least one uh, extinction of another species in the network? Interestingly, as I mentioned, the, the correlation among um, metrics of a given group is really strong. So that means those metrics contain similar information about the stability of the system. But the correlation of metric, the average co correlation between metrics of different groups is quite low. So it's on average 0.1, which means that we can interpret these groups as kind of independent stability components. So in sum, um, we know, we've known in ecology for a long time that stability is multifaceted um, and that many metrics are used to quantify this concept. But some of the metrics are a very, what we find here is that for traffic networks, some of the metrics are really strongly correlated with each other. And that allows us to identify three independent stability components. And so this means in very simple terms that in those traffic communities, there is kind of three ways of being stable or unstable. Now, um, with this, what this suggests is that if you want to measure the overall stability of an ecological community, you don't need to measure 27 different metrics, but you could only measure three metrics, one for each of these three groups, and that would give you a kind of overall um, vision of the response of the community to different types of perturbations. But how do we choose um, the metric that you select? Um, this remains kind of an open question, but an idea is that, so the modularity algorithm gives you kind of an idea of the overall structure of the correlation between the metrics, but it doesn't give you a detailed map of um, the distance, the similarity between different metrics. So one thing that can be done is uh, we can use hierarchical clustering um, that would use the correlation between the metrics to quantify a distance between metrics. And then using a dendrogram, you can see like how similar different metrics from a given group are. So for example, if we look at the blue group, um, we could decide if we can uh, only measure one metric, for example, because it's in the field and, and there is time or, or money constraint, you could decide to, to select the metric here that is the most correlated with all the other metrics of, of that group. But if you can measure several metrics, you could decide to go for metrics of that group um, that are most dissimilar from each other. So for example, this one and um, this one. So this does not provide a definitive answer, but it gives kind of some tools if to, to select um, metrics um, to measure stability of uh, trophic communities. Now, I mean, of course, this is not the end uh, of the story because if we want to address uh, the stability of ecological system, there is a lot of upcoming, of upcoming remaining challenges. Um, for example, here I've stressed that we've studied um, stability metrics in trophic communities, in communities where species only eat each other. But we know very well that in ecological systems, species depend on each other um, in many different ways. And so they eat each other, they compete with each other, they facilitate each other. And so one of the questions that remains open is how do different interaction types affect the correlation between stability metrics? Would we find a similar map of correlations between stability metrics in other type of ecological networks? Also, um, studying stability requires thinking um, on perturbations, what perturbations are applied in the system. So um, here um, you have the perturbations that we obtained from the, we recorded in the different papers that we analyzed and the, the, the height of these boxes reflect the proportion of times that these uh, perturbations have been studied in the literature. And you see that, for example, spatial perturbation, so typically habitat modification, habitat fragmentation, or habitat destruction, have been relatively little studied in the ecological literature. But um, surprising, this is surprising because it's actually habitat fragmentation and destruction is actually considered one of the main threats of human um, activities on ecological systems. Another thing is that if you look at how many uh, perturbations people typically studied in ecological studies, the mean is 1.4 perturbation on average. But we know very well that 
all these perturbations are, are occurring simultaneously. And so there's climate change plus habitat destruction plus species extinction and all of that occurs simultaneously in ecological systems. So we don't really know how those perturbations combine to affect um, ecosystems. Then I mentioned that um, the, the, the metrics that are used in empirical and versus theoretical studies are, are typically not the same. So uh, for example, in empirical system, the metric that is mo the most frequently used is resistance. So it's how far a system is displaced from its current state after press perturbation. But in theoretical studies, it's um, the dominant eigenvalue of the dynamical system. So this is a problem because again, if we want to confront theory with empirical data, if we don't use the same metrics and these, if these are metrics that are not strongly correlated with each other, then we cannot really compare studies performed in, in, in empirical uh, work versus theoretical work. And finally, I mentioned that um, most of the studies that uh, we reviewed in the ecological literature focused on system that had one or two species. And so this raises the question of how we can scale up our understanding of stability that seems to be based on very simple or simplified system uh, to more complex uh, ecological communities, in particular communities that have diverse species. And so, for example, here, um, the thickness of the line reflect the proportion of studies in the ecological literature that measure stability on all species versus some species versus at the community level. So for example, total biomass of the community. And what you see is that uh, most of the studies measure stability on some kind of aggregated metric, um, for example, total biomass. And Actually, if you think of that, if you think of a complex system that you're studying in the field, um, we don't really know how measure at the species level um, are related with measure at the community level. And so this raises the question of what metric to measure at what, um, at what scale of organization in an ecological system. So I'd like to conclude on the fact that um, so far our understanding of ecological stability um, remains quite fragmented. And, and this despite decades of interest in, in the ecological literature and improving this understanding could be quite important if we want to better predict how ecosystems are going to respond to future changes and environmental conditions. But also if we want to create tools that allow us to, to assess um, the health of ecosystems and also to prioritize systems that are more fragile than others uh, in, in the face of future changes. Well, thank you very much um, for, for your attention. And I'd like to thank my collaborators on, on the various papers that I cited in this presentation. And I'm happy to take questions. OK, thanks so much, Sonia, for this, I think, uh, very, very long debate on ecosystem stability. Uh, this is a old story, and, and, and your group are, are sharing uh, some light, uh, some new things on this, on this research. Okay, so we have one question from Nelo Lampo. Uh, just two questions. Which community detection algorithm do you use? And the second one, how do you extract the meaning, sensitivity to press, etc., of community you detect? Um, so the community detection we used in this case is maximized modularity. That is, um, Virginia used the, the one that is implemented in Gephi. Um, so I guess there's many different ways you could calculate that, but um, it seems to be quite robust so far, as far as we can tell. Um, I don't, I'm not sure what you mean, but how do you extract the meaning? Um, so, I don't know. Yeah, but you mean the meaning uh, of the groups, maybe? Uh, yeah, because you can turn your micro on and ask directly to clarify this point. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So uh, sorry if I I was not clear. I mean, you show the network where you highlight three three groups, three communities. Yes. I mean, the and then you identify uh, these three groups with each group with uh, I mean one uh, one group of metrics. Uh, for instance, the sensitivity to press. So in this sense, I the meaning. So. I don't understand how do you how do you make this association? So the association of the of the of the group of a given community to a 
to the common future of a, of a, of the matrix. Um, so you mean how we attribute the name to the group, basically, or yes, how we interpret yes, the yes, group? Yes, yeah. Yes. So, uh, so uh, just by observing the metrics that are within the group. So, for example, um, early response to polls um, is is just the three metrics that are in the yellow group are all um, metrics that quantify the response of the system to post perturbation. They're all based on the on the Jacobian of the system, and they measure the early response. So it's reactivity, for example, maximum amplification and time to maximum amplification. So that's what happens really early after the pulse is applied to the community. So in this sense, um, if you look at the metric that composes the group, what you can see is that the yellow the yellow group are short term response of the system, whereas the two other groups, the blue and the green, are long term responses. So, for example, our infinity, what we call infinity, is basically the dominant eigenvalue of the the real um, the real part of the dominant eigenvalue of the system. It quantifies the long term return rate of the system after post perturbation, and this is. This is in the blue group. So this is in, yeah, it's, it's a more long-term response. So yellow is short-term and response to pulse and um, blue and green are long-term responses. Then what we noticed, but it's just by observing the metrics is that the green groups is contains only metric that quantify response of the system to press. So in that sense, um, we have um, yellow is pulse, green is press. Um, and then we call it sensitivity because all the metrics that are in the green group are metrics that quantify change in biomass of the system after a press perturbation, which in our case is either a change of uh, a biomass or a change in mortality of the species. Um, so it's, it's just by observing the metrics. And the blue group, um, it's, it contains metric that quantify the system response to, to press, pulse, or noise. So it gathers metrics that quantify um, response to different types of perturbations and all long-term. And then what we notice that seems to put them together is that they are metrics that quantify how far the system is um, from a given abrupt change. So for example, um, the metrics that are in this group are tolerance metric that quantify um, what, ex what increase of mortality you should apply to a given species or to all species simultaneously before you see at least one extinction in the network. So there's no, yeah, I, I don't know if my answer is clear, but it's, it's the name we give are very subjective is just observation of, of, of the grouping and our interpretation of, of the grouping of the metrics. I understand, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so another, to another uh, question by Bly. Uh, which is the role of the network structure on the difference between the different measures of ecological resilience? Um, so this is something we started exploring, but um, we didn't find anything significant so far. Um, so we couldn't really see a generic pattern in terms of how for example, how the structure modularity. So things we measured was like uh, maximum trophic level, modularity, nestedness, and so on. We try to see how that affects correlation between metrics. And um, so far, we haven't really seen a clear pattern in terms of how the structure affects uh, what we see in terms of correlation between metrics. But this could also be due to the fact that um, we use the niche model to generate the backbone of the network. So in the end, we have a relatively narrow range of, um, of structure expressed in those networks. Um, so, I mean, this is a very interesting question, but I, I don't have a, a proper answer uh, to it right now. Okay, so another one by Daniela Moore. Do you have an intuition understanding on how these groups of strongly correlated metrics are model dependent? For example, would we find something similar if we use a competitive flood table terra model? No, this is this is a very a great question. This is something that we're currently working on. So, if um, there's two things that you can work on, right? So, um, if you change, for example, the shape of the functional response, so you go from a more complex to a simpler system, do you retrieve those same groups? So, this seems to be the case. 
But now, indeed, like you say, a competitive model, what happens if you use a competitive model? So we, we haven't really looked into competitive models, but what we're doing currently is studying these correlations in multiplex ecological networks. So what happens if you don't have only feeding interactions, but you also have facilitation competition together? And what we see is that uh, non-feeding interactions destroy those correlation. Um, what happens is, uh, and that's very interesting, and we're, we're not really clearly understanding right now what's going on. But for example, when you add competition, the blue group splits in two. Um, why? <laughs> so far, we don't know. But it seems that, therefore, uh, the type of interaction you take into account affects the stability metrics in a way that it changes their correlations. Um, and so this is work that is ongoing. And I, yeah, but it's I find it very interesting. So. Um, whether these are generic results or, or really specific to what we did. And it seems that it's, it could be kind of generic to traffic networks, but probably not to other types of networks. Okay, thanks so much. So another question by David Alonso. Since your model parameters can be related to temperature, do you have any idea about how temperature increase will affect the three different components of stability in ecosystems? Yeah, I know that that's another very interesting question. We haven't looked at that at all, but you're right. Yes. Uh, so in these models, you can all the the rates can be can be linked to temperature, and we haven't looked into that at all. But it would be really interesting as well. Yeah. So how does climate change affect correlation between stability metrics? I I wouldn't be able to to answer. Okay. Another question by Javier Gamarra. Would it be sensible to assume that color of noise in your system would strongly change the groups encounter? Yeah, it's the same. It's a very good question. I, I would assume it could, but I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know how. So we haven't looked into that. The only thing we looked at was white noise. Um, and I, I wouldn't know. Um, but you're right, of course. I mean, these, these models are, are so simple in many ways. And, um, and yes, if you want to make them more realistic, it would be interesting to include more realistic noise as well. So I, I wouldn't know. Okay. So I think there are no more questions, no more raised hands. Okay, so thank you so much, Sonia. Your uh, talk was really, really stimulating. Uh, so with your talk, we, we finish today's sessions about theoretical ecology and um, ecological dynamical systems. So thanks to all of the speakers. Uh, today we had a, a really intensive day and we are uh, looking for you uh, for uh, the session about tomorrow that will be about uh, systems and synthetic biology and we will start as usual at, at 10 a.m. in the morning. So have a nice day and see all of you tomorrow. Thanks so much. Thanks again. Bye. Bye.